Europeans would tell the Cinderella story about a drunk lady turning into a pumpkin after drinking too late into the night and using her shoe as a glass, while politics in America was being decided by drunks in taverns and bars, and Americans drank more than the English, but less than the Scandinavians, and the Scots kept up with everybody. Along came the big distilleries, and America became a grown-up country, and the Scotch-Irish came over with a better whiskey recipe, and America had firmly shifted from a rum-drinking country to a whiskey-drinking one. In the 1820s, five percent of all patents issued were contraptions for making alcohol, and with the new and better and bigger stills, more people became whiskey makers until so much was being bottled that the price had fallen to 25 cents per gallon even before the stock market crashed in 1819, and thereafter so many farmers were making whiskey that it was no longer valuable as a means of commodity exchange. After the Napoleonic Wars, Europe didn't want America's surplus corn and wheat any more, but the demand for grain grown east of the Appalachian Mountains increased because more people were living in cities and didn't grow their own food. So instead of using precious grain to make whiskey, America's Americans in eastern cities were buying whiskey from Kentucky. The Erie Canal lowered the cost of shipping grain and made it possible to keep corn and wheat for sale rather than having to condense it into distilled spirits so more people were eating wheat instead of drinking it and the nation almost started to withdraw from its alcohol habit. President Monroe said that the construction of the Erie Canal in 1817 would bankrupt the country, so bonds were sold privately, and the Irish were hired to build the Erie Canal, and were filled with Monongahela whiskey to get it done by 1825. The invention of the steamboat made business boom further, and instead of floating whiskey down the Mississippi and having to walk back home, people could now ride upriver and play cards at their leisure. The Irish didn't necessarily want to blend, and there were also many isolated communities of Prussian Germans in the Midwest who stuck together. Parishioners leaving the morning services or returning to the Anglo-Saxon religious citadel from Vespers were outraged by the blare of a brass band, the lusty malt mellowed singing and the uproar of hundreds of Germans emptying and banging their steins on the oaken tables. The German Americans, page 291. Despite differences in language, immigrants had alcohol in common and a German beer company started mass-producing beer, and the Germans opened their own saloons, and most beer joints were German, and many of them were owned and managed from overseas. Before the year of revolutions in 1848 that would send so many good and decent Europeans fleeing to America, Britain had decided to let more people vote in 1832, and so 5% of the population now qualified, and in Europe the nobility had believed that the common folk needed the old traditions to give meaning and structure to their lives, and they knew that change would bring nothing but trouble. Immigrants fleeing the old country for America brought plenty of cuttings over from their grapevines, but the cuttings failed to thrive, and the temperance people thought it was God's will that Europeans repeatedly failed to make better grapes grow in America. In Austria, there was plenty of fine food and great wine and high bourgeois living in Vienna where the Austrians indulged in a continual party with whirling waltzes and marzipan, and the word, word waltzen was from the Austrian word to roll, so the waltz was their version of rock and roll, making young people laugh and adults squirm. Strauss had been the jazz of his day, and this was the society that Marx would complain about, and this was also the society that was the target of the year of revolutions in 1848. George Bailey said that one German word for drunk was blue, and that Strauss called it the Blue Danube because he'd been drunk at the time he wrote that piece of music. George Bailey said that the Germans wore leather armor called Sherm that meant protection, and that was why they were called Shermans. 
and the Alemannic was simply the land of the ale-man, a word from the Greek aeluin that meant to be distraught and had become a term related to sorcery and intoxication, then found its way into the English word ale. The Alemanni lived in Schwabia, in the land of the High Rhine, at the headwaters of the Danube, and their homeland included Alsace, with the Phosgus Mountains, and especially the Black Forest, and the Bavarians were their neighbors to the east, and the Alemanni were the ones who had held back the Romans at the Battle of Teutonburg. Clovis had been the first king of France with his big military success in knocking out the Alemanni in Schwabia. And Einstein, Heisenberg, Herderlin, and Heidegger were all Schwabians. The Schiller wine invented by Schwabians was named after the German word Schillern that meant gladness or to shimmer, which they thought it did because they'd been so glad to get any at all after the devastation of the Thirty Years' War had ravished their countryside. What was left of the harvest had been gathered into one vat, both red and white together, and this blend of Schiller wine had thereafter been a tradition with the Schwabians. Fodor said the Schwabians liked to eat a second breakfast around nine o'clock, having, quote, smoked bacon, dark rye bread, and a glass of cherry brandy, close quote. On the 21st of April in 1855, the mayor of Chicago closed the beer halls but not the whiskey bars, and the Germans and the Irish rioted. The mob surged down Clark Street toward City Hall. Police and deputies met it in massed formation. One of the rioters followed a shotgun and blew the arm off a policeman, and firing began on both sides. One rioter gave up his life for the lager beer cause, and a number of others were wounded. The German-Americans, page 292. Out of 12,000 protesters, only one baby died from being tear-gassed, and as railroads were laid down across America, immigrants came riding or working on them, bringing their alcohol recipes carefully carried over from the old country, where alcohol had been their best friend and solace in having to put up with their old repressive governments. The Dutch had been the most successful at starting a colony in America, but when the English defeated Holland in 1664 and renamed the city of New York, the word Dutch became a blad, bad slang word for foreigner. The British Queen Anne of the House of Hanover offered free transportation to Germans willing to move to America in 1709 and the queen wanted to get rid of the germans who'd made their way to england after escaping the fighting between the catholics and protestants in their home countries and the founding of the new house of hanover had encouraged them to seek refuge in england when thirteen thousand of them had arrived in england they had little left over after the journey and the Germans were living in the streets of London and Liverpool until the Queen decided that they could be shipped away, and some were sent to Ireland, but most made it to America. When they got to the New World, these German immigrants were called Newlanders, and were auctioned off as indentured servants as soon as the ship docked, and the newspapers would carry advertisements about a shipload of Germans arriving for auction and most would be sold into service before they were allowed off the boat. Even though some of the redemptioners fell into the hands of cruel, lecherous, or abusive employers, they were the lucky ones. The less fortunate were those who died on the voyage from Europe or were lost in the frequent shipwrecks. Many died of starvation or disease on the way over. The German-Americans, page 23. The New Landers were packed onto ships almost as tightly as Africans, but were given a little more room because they usually had some luggage, having come from a colder climate. And one historian wrote that, quote, Many immigrant vessels were lost at sea, and the shipwrecks went unreported, out of fear that they might discourage other immigrants from Germany. The German-Americans, Ibid. Shipping companies sent brightly painted wagons throughout Germany to advertise this free shipping deal, and they gave away free schnapps with their speeches about America. And when the Germans stepped on board, 
They signed a piece of paper making them liable for the price of passage, which included the cost of any others who might die on the journey. When the ship docked in America, many Germans were indebted for life, and the U.S. Congress finally passed a law allowing the immigrants to sue the ship's captain for ill treatment, and in 1819 Congress limited the number of passengers per tonnage which put an end to the shipping company's profits. Immigration laws had been basically against Catholics, and nobody minded trying to exclude them because it was believed that they took orders from Rome before America, and that belief was exacerbated by the reality that Italy figured that once an Italian, always an Italian, so the government of Italy wanted to be able to call back all Italian Americans for military service whenever it became necessary. More Germans came over in the 1840s and showed Americans how to make better beer, and St. Louis became the beer capital of the nation and had its own newspaper printed in the German language, and Nebraska had too. Miller was originally Mueller, and then came Schlitz and Budweiser, and there were also Pabst and Blatz who were brewing beer, and the temperance people thought Mr. N. Heiser Bush was a German Hun who wanted to corrupt the morality of innocent Americans. The U.S. Marines were sent into Brooklyn in 1869 to destroy distilleries refusing to pay taxes, and 800 men with fixed bayonets fought back a mob protecting the liquor factories, and Colonel George Custer was sent into Kentucky to destroy destroy moonshine stills in 1871. The Prohibition Party started in 1868 and had a candidate in every election for the next 12 terms. And Kansas was the first state to go dry in 1880 and so Dorothy had to run away from Kansas. There were seven dry states by 1900 but going dry meant only that the sale of alcohol was banned, not home manufacture or consumption, and the better off could still stock their wet bars with alcohol delivered from neighboring states. The dry people got together and took over the shipping companies and the steamboats and the canal lines, and temperance became an economic powerhouse and innkeepers complained they couldn't make any money unless they sold alcohol, so the temperance people relented and opened their own dry public inns. Carrie Nation's first husband would go to his Masonic Lodge and drink, and Masonic Lodges were a good place to drink alcohol while neglected, neglected wives gossiped about the satanic activities going on at the Masonic meetings. In the old country, the best kind of building material was called freestone, and it was a kind of rock that didn't chip or splinter when it was cut, and the masons cutting the freestone out of the quarry were called freestone masons, which was shortened to freemasons, and while the Masonic lodges were great places for their members to gather around alcohol, Carrie Nation wrote, I was so hungry for his caresses and love, she recalled years later. Ardent Spirits, page 148. Carrie Nation would follow couples around watching for them to kiss, and then she would threaten them with her umbrella. And Carrie Nation also hated her husband's tobacco habit. Their only daughter was born frail, only six months before the husband drank himself to death. And the little girl's right cheek became infected and fell off, and her face had almost grown back when her jaw clamped shut for eight years, but after her health improved, Carrie's daughter got married and then went crazy and spent the rest of her life in an asylum. Carrie Nation had become a widow at the age of 21, and in 1913 less than one percent of women had jobs outside the home, while people were drinking more because machines allowed them more time to drink. Factories were making alcohol instead of small batches on farms using leftover grain, and the temperance people still considered beer to be a healthful drink, different from the alcohol found in gin or whiskey. 
Beer was called liquid bread, while distilled spirits were said to be the cause of debauchery and sinfulness, so husbands began to drink their whiskey out of the presence of the ladies. It was easy for Carrie Nation to cause a fuss over alcohol, because speaking on a soapbox in public was the only entertainment around before television and radio. And one of Edison's first films showed a scene of Carrie Nation breaking up a bar with her axe. And Carrie Nation wasn't sent to jail very often, because the police would be admitting that there was a lot of bars around for her to ransack. Alcohol factories turned liquor into something produced in other states or countries rather than being a neighborhood product. And factories made cities grow because people working in them had to live nearby. And immigrants went to the cities where they could live around people who spoke their own language. The first immigrants had come from the Scandinavian countries and from Germany, France, England, and Holland. And after 1889, most of them came from Lower Europe and the Slavic countries of Italy, Sicily, Serbia, and Russia. And in the 1880s, 20% had come from the Lower Countries. And in the next decade, half of them. And in the, ne 18, in the 1890s and three quarters by 1910. Congress had pa passed a law in 1882 charging 50 cents per head to get into America. And that suddenly made more people want to come over because it was seen as a paid-for privilege rather than a punishment or an exile. Lawmakers found out that immigration issues got them votes, so Congress started making arguments about immigration and declared in 1890 that the American frontier was all gone. Immigration peaked out at 1,300,000 in 1907, and America cut back on immigration in 1921 because people decided, thanks to the Italians, that only criminals and paupers were coming over from Europe, and few people knew that Christopher Columbus had been an Italian. Temperance people were from all different backgrounds and had little in common other than some overlapping religious beliefs, but they became a group with a common enemy to unite them, and that enemy was the devil being blamed for all the alcohol being consumed. The primary template for temperance was the National Women's Christian Temperance Union, and the temperance was less about stopping alcohol consumption and more about fighting the devil. The early church fathers had wanted to prevent drunkenness, but not drinking, and fines had been imposed, and people were put into stocks and or whipped for showing intoxication in public, and drunks had been forced to wear a red D around their necks. Most temperance people were Protestant, and if they got rid of alcohol, the Protestants thought that God would be pleased. Temperance had begun with the Calvinists at Andover that was a seminary school, and college had been intended to prepare young men for the ministry where the majority of students were the sons of the elite, and those who failed to make the grade in spiritual work had to settle instead for unimportant government jobs. One theology professor from Andover wrote that he knew forty ministers, quote, who were either drunkards or so far addicted to drinking that their reputation and usefulness were greatly impaired, if not utterly ruined. Ardent Spirits, page 28. With the guidance and wisdom of college-trained ministers, preachers held meetings and printed pamphlets eschewing the evils of alcohol, and the pamphlets were sent to other ministers to be read from pulpits on Sundays, and preachers would, would travel from town to town encouraging the locals to start temperance societies. And the temperance people had picnics and parades and dances on holidays without any alcohol, and they would try to make people sober by signing a pledge. The drinkers would often fight back, but at best they were merely a nuisance.
Hardened crusaders made their own towns and counties dry, and would then attempt to make the rest of the country good like themselves, and temperance societies gave people a reason to gather together and listen to fiery speeches, and one of the major themes was independence, with drinkers said to be in bondage to the bottle while the temperance people were truly free. Temperance became very patriotic, and sobriety was taught in schools like the Hitler Youth, and giving up alcohol was said to be like getting rid of Britain, and they would read the Declaration of Independence substi substituting Prince Alcohol for King George, and the temperance people convinced farmers to cut down their apple trees by telling them that the apple had been Adam's downfall. Because the temperance promoters were mostly people of leisure, with the time and money to pursue their liberal f liberal fantasies, the reality of the work done in mines and mills and factories and slaughterhouses was unknown to the temperance pushers, and Rorabaugh said that by 1839 a large majority of the doctors and ministers had become teetotalers, and their children were just desperate to go west to find a drink. The Pacific Northwest was the place to go, where the tradition of drinking was still strong, and the lumberjacks were leading the parade, with plenty of evidence that the territorial founding fathers enjoyed their cups. Arthur A. Denny was said to be, quote, the only member of the legislature who consistently lives up to the principles of the Maine Liquor Law, close quote, and George N. McConaughey, president of the first legislative council, was an alcoholic who allegedly drowned in Puget Sound as a result of the riotous drinking that closed the first legislative session. A writer to the editor of The Courier noted that drunkenness was so common in Olympia that the territory was developing a reputation for intemperance which was discouraging migrants from crossing the Columbia River. The Dry Years, Prohibition and Social Change in Washington by Norman H. Clark, Seattle and London, University of Washington Press, 1965-1988, page 23. In 1844, Engels wrote in his Condition of the Working Class that the temperance societies had not diminished drunkenness and the Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Methodists, Evangelicals, and others joined forces with the Temperance Union to build asylums for the incapacitated, and some of these institutions allowed people to come and go freely, while others were more like prisons. Britain had offloaded their poor to America because they believed poverty to be of genetic origin and that getting rid of genetically poor English by shipping them to the American colonies was in Britain's best interests. And the British Poor Law of 1834 built workhouses in England for the poor that were intentionally cruel and miserable in order to discourage people from being poor. The Crown paid twenty million pounds to compensate English owners for the loss of their slaves in 1833 after slavery was repealed in England, and the Corn Laws were supposed to keep the price of English corn and wheat using keep up the price of English corn and wheat using stiff tariffs on the corn and wheat grown by slaves in the American South. But with the higher price of corn and wheat in England it became a hardship for the common Englishmen to brew their own alcohol from corn and wheat, so they began using potatoes, and that put a hardship on the Irish. Vodka was made from potatoes, but Russians didn't grow potatoes until the time of Catherine the Great, who was a German. And when she brought potatoes to Russia, they called it devil's weed because it was so hard to get rid of after planting. The English bought potatoes from the Belgians who had gotten a load of potatoes from America contaminated with blight, and those diseased potatoes found their way into Ireland in 1843, or so the story goes in trying to blame America for what was clearly a British problem. When British commissioners finally made their way northward to find out why the Irish were starving, the Crown thought the Irish were making vodka instead of having suffered potato blight, and the English refused to help feed the starving Irish, which forced them to immigrate to America after the Great Potato Famine of 1845. 
The small book, Rape of the Fair Country, ended with the great Chartist uprising, which was just one of many in the year of revolutions in 1848. And while many historians thought the year of revolutions had begun with the Italians, it had actually begun with the Irish moving to America and spreading the word that the New World was now leaving the Old World behind. The immigrants were smaller and shorter than people who had lived with access to more food, having come over out of hunger that would make people do just about anything, and Americans heard rumors of cannibalism back home in their home countries. With the new science of eugenics, the U.S. government explained that the smaller immigrants were genetically inferior and passed laws about marriage and promoted sterilization, not wanting Americans to get smaller by breeding with immigrants. Immigration laws began to change after the waves of eager migrants from Europe had run their course and those left behind resigned themselves to the new democratic Europe that came out of the year of revolutions in 1848, and anyone bold enough to come across the ocean already had by the time prohibition hit, which made up the minds of any European still on the fence about whether or not to come over. The Irish and the Italians didn't blend in America any better than the Germans and the English, but Germans had more loyalty to America than to the old country, and during Hitler's war, the German-Americans started calling themselves American Germans. In 1914, President Wilson gave a speech attacking Americans who, quote, need hyphens in their names because only part of them have come over, close quote. The German Americans, page 393. Wilson said that if you lived here long enough, you could drop the hyphen from European American. And right after the Great War, America closed its doors to all the dreadful people in Europe, limiting their opportunity in America to 2% immigration, precisely because of the horror show of Europe's war in the trenches. By the time of Hitler's war, Europe was still segregated by nationality, with the Germans and the French and the English living apart, and having America help Germany after the Great War had not been welcomed by either the English or the French. During those days when Hitler was dreaming of making Germany Jew-free, Harry Anslinger wanted to make America alcohol-free, and Anslinger wanted a $1,000 fine and six months in jail for buying alcohol, with the second offense costing $5,000 and two years in jail. Hitler had only gotten drunk once and had ended up sleeping in the cold in a ditch outside of town. And Hitler swore he would never drink again, and he didn't, because his drugs were medicine. Everyone had pitched in with the debate over beer versus spirits, and the prohibitionists landed a right hook by declaring that the grain used to make beer was needed for the Great War, and when Congress outlawed the use of grain for making alcohol after the war, the German brewers went out of business, and their subsequent poverty emphasized the bad feelings against them. Before Prohibition, Germans had been laughed at or considered odd or bothersome, but as soon as Prohibition started, Germans became unwanted and in some circles became the enemy all over again. There were isolated areas of Prussian Germans in North Dakota, Nebraska, and Kansas, who had once been invited into Russia by Catherine the Great with a promise of exemption from military service. And when they came over to America, the Germans stuck together, helping each other with the farming skills they'd brought with them, and that was where the bush cutters had come from. When the Great War broke out, American boys started torturing Dachshunds, Dachshunds, Schnauzers, Reamer Armors, and German Shepherds, which suddenly became Alsatians instead, and General Pershing changed his, changed his name from Fershin. Fershin, P-F-O-E-R-S-C-H-I-N, and Eisenhower became Eisenhower with an O-W instead of an A-U, and the British royal family became Windsor instead of Battenberg, and the Battenbergs became Mountbattens. On the 16th of April in 1917, 
President Wilson declared war on Germany. Any intelligent American mechanic could see that if the Europeans hadn't been a lot of ignorant, underpaid, ignorant, underpaid foreigners who drank, smoked, were loose about women and wasteful in their methods of production, the war could never have happened. The Big Money, page 54. The Declaration of Independence had first been published in America in a German-language newspaper. The Declaration of Independence had first been published in America in a German-language newspaper, and Benjamin Franklin recorded that of the six printing presses in Pennsylvania, two were German and another two were half-German. The German Americans, page 363. The most popular novels ever written were by a German-American named Theodor Hermann Albert Dreiser, and German-Americans founded the Travelers' Aid Society, and the man who bought Manhattan from the Indians for twenty-four dollars had been a German sent by the Dutch, and the price was the equivalent of twelve thousand pelts. Recruiting for the Great War succeeded in mixing the different nationalities in America, from Italian and Irish gangs in the eastern cities to German and Swedish barons ruling the Midwest, brought together into army tra training camps alongside the French hiding out in the South and all the English descendants settled in the West. The Great War would succeed in making Americans want to keep out the dreadful people from Europe and limit immigration to 2%, but the primary reason the U.S. cut back on immigration in the 20s was because of communism. Red hunts by the U.S. government deported thousands in 1920, while Samuel Gompers warned that the American working man would join the Wobblies if prohibited from drinking beer. And Gompers said... Gomper said that making alcohol illegal would turn all the working people into communists. The IWW got a lot of mileage out of prohibition because people would join the Wobblies just to get a pint of beer at their meetings. And Gompers testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee that, quote, depriving the American working man of his glass of beer tends to promote industrial unrest and discontent, close quote. Ardent Spirits, page 337. Everyone had been fighting over the beer or spirits debate when the prohibitionists declared that grain was needed for the Great War, and men wanted to placate their women short of giving them the right to vote, and they thought that by giving in to the women's clamor for prohibition, it would at least keep them out of the workplace. When Russia outlawed the making of alcohol at the beginning of the Great War, it had the propitious effect of everybody rushing to enlist because they were promised a free daily alcohol ration in the army. Congress had prepared to outlaw the use of grain for making alcohol and beer under the dictum that the Great War needed all the grain America could, could grow for the war effort, and grain was strictly rationed, and even inferior grain that had been used to make alcohol was now too precious to go towards making beer or whiskey. When the Great War ended, countless government of offices, officials, offices had been keeping track of the storing and hoarding of grain, so the prohibitionists simply used the leftover bureaucracy built up during the war for their own purpose of banning the sale and manufacture of alcohol. Prohibition was a natural phenomenon of government workers not wanting to lose their jobs, and so it was an end run. And the extension of the Food Control Bill was brought before the U.S. Congress, introduced on the floor by a Norwegian-American Republican from Minnesota who'd gone to St. Olaf's College. Mr. Volstead was not even against liquor, but had become the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, and he thought the Food Control Bill and its fellow traveler, the Prohibition Amendment, were an important matter of constitutional law. So while few people understood the law that made Prohibition legal, that made Prohibition legal, the Supreme Court voted five to four in favor, and the House debated it for another three months and passed it 255 to 136. And then the Senate debated it for a month and passed it with a minor amendment, and this version passed the House 321 to 70 on the 10th of October, 
in 1919. President Wilson came back from signing the Versailles Treaty to be handed the Prohibition Law, and Wilson promptly vetoed the Volstead Act, and Congress overrode his veto on the 28th of October, and two months after the Great War ended, the 18th Amendment became law on the 16th of January in 1920. Congress had hoped that in passing Prohibition their constituents would receive the message that God was not dead, despite what had just happened in Europe, and Prohibition was seen at the time as a victory of rural, God-fearing America over the sinful cities. Since the majority of Americans were law-abiding, it wasn't thought that the dry laws would be much of a problem. What alcohol Americans had in storage was quickly consumed as the flu followed the railroads, and alcohol was an excellent medicinal remedy for the flu. One and a half million Americans had gone overseas, including most of the doctors and nurses, and more people died of the flu in the Great War than in the fighting. The flu virus had already taken hold well before the symptoms appeared, and when the viruses grew to a certain volume, they gained a gene that told them to cease working, and that instruction was what the immune system would use against them in the future. These viruses infected and stripped away all tissues in need of repair, so colds and flu were like cleaning closets, but there was an overwhelming amount of closets that needed cleaned in 1920, because the hardship of the Great War had left everyone weakened. Everyone was already suffering when the flu hit, and people wounded and hungry and homeless were on the move, so that disease spread like the wind, and 600 thousand people died of the great flu in America. Today the same percentage of fatalities would be two million dead, and while the government initially de denied the problem, in many places there were not enough healthy people to bury the dead. The flu was worldwide and killed between 40 and 100 million people. And wearing cloth masks didn't help because the flu virus was so small that it went right through the fabric. And the flu targeted people who were between 20 and 25 years old. And it was so bad that 60 million people could not be accounted for in its wake. It would take two weeks to make antibodies for any particular strain of flu. And the immune system was not interested in overcoming the initial viral assault, but in preventing it from happening again after the virus had done its job, because those closets had already been cleaned. And the virus was not supposed to kill the host, but was designed to spread itself around a local area for the purpose of killing off mutations. Gene mutations strove to improve traits in species, ever trying for better combinations, as seen in any fish, fish hatch, where the majority of the fry have mutations that become fish food because over 90% of the eggs are not viable. In the wake of the great flu, people in 1920 thought that perhaps God would have some mercy after the flu epidemic if people quit drinking alcohol. The big question at the end of the Great War was how to control people now that God was dead and the kings and queens of Europe had been dragged off their thrones and replaced by communism in Russia. And Americans had to make the choice either to go commie or find some other way to make people behave, so they opted for prohibition. Drunks were everywhere now that factories were making huge quantities of alcohol instead of the small homemade batches brewed on farms. And opposing alcohol had always been easy because drunken people looked pretty bad in the light of day. And fomenting opposition in the public square could draw large laughing crowds, and all anyone needed was a soapbox and a loud voice. While church was interesting enough, people didn't really think of themselves as sinners, so they opted for pointing out the more obvious drunks among them as agents of the devil. 
An intoxicant was defined as anything having one half of one percent alcohol, and there had been only seven dry states in 1900. Then New England and North and South Dakota went dry, and women wanting to become involved in politics would ask the men in the office what they had done that day to stop the devil. A lady in an old newsreel from 1920 said, quote, "Drinking alcohol interferes with the oxygen-carrying capacity of the red blood corpuscles. Drinking alcohol will give you a green brain, a red nose, a white liver, a black heart, and a yellow streak through and through." Close quote. Prohibition was supposed to make Americans hard-working and reliable, but instead it turned them into lawbreakers. Universally, the public the big city masses included, believed the dry law was here to stay and that bootlegging would be virtually nil. That's easy to understand. Historically, we as a nation are law-abiding. As prohibition approached, the thinking was that no self-respecting man would risk the shameful stigma of arrest just to get a drink. The Dry and Lawless Years by Judge John H. Lyle, New York, Dell Publishing, Prentice Hall, 1960, page 45. After the insanity of the Great War, the Twenties roared because everyone had come to believe that the government was nuts, so people worked very hard to prevail in the face of government's best efforts to enforce prohibition, something that had not been a popular vote, but had been pushed through by politicians only guessing at what the voters wanted. Now people were too busy trying to recover after the Great War to care much at all about the new government bureaucrats on the home front, and the politicians were desperate not to lose their jobs in the face of all the soldiers coming back from the Great War looking for work, and jumping on the temperance bandwagon would certainly keep them busy and make them feel useful now that the war was over. The women had wanted to keep their men at home with prohibition, away from their drinking clubs and saloons, and alcohol had been taking the blame for interfering with the sanctity of marriage, so prohibition was seen as a solution, but would backfire when women started cutting their hair and seeking out the speakeasy, speakeasies where tea was served as, as an alternative for the, quote, ladies but it was not long before the speakeasies dispensed with the tea. They were small and dark and choked with people. The air was so dense with smoke as to water one's eyes. They were an inferno of noise, punctuated by the shrill, drunken laughter of women. The, sex, the sexes were drinking together in public for the first time, and they weren't holding it well. The Kind of Guy I Am, page 170. The unexpected result of prohibition was that it liberated women from the home as they went out in search of alcohol. And to add to the mayhem in 1920, women were given the vote. When the Great War was over, everybody had a good reason to drink, and the point was to just forget about the war. And breaking the law during prohibition was as much fun as drinking, because the trenches had shown how stupid governments were, so people drank illegal alcohol to spite them, and loyalty shifted from one's superiors to one's fellows, and the definition of virtue during prohibition was looking out for one's drinking buddies. The people who ran the alcohol factories could get rich selling good alcohol out the back door and the inspectors could get rich for not noticing those sales, and the supervisors and the police and the lawyers could get rich going along, and they did. So prohibition was great for business, but it was the wrong kind of business. When it came time to rally around the flag and go fight Hitler, FDR seriously wondered if this criminalized nation of, full of cheaters and schemers was up to the task. The U.S. Congress set up a fund for $2 million and 2,000 agents to enforce prohibition, and eight years later they were told it would take $300, and even then it would probably fail. In 1925, the Prohibition Bureau could not account for at least 10 million gallons of alcohol, enough for a bottle for every man, woman, and child in the country, 
and they scratched their heads and made big guesses, but the government was not able to enforce prohibition, and there were so many people making so much money because of it that nobody wanted to even begin to think about repealing the prohibition amendment. <clears throat> Bootleggers rode Harley Davidson motorcycles during prohibition, and so did the police. So it was usually a contest of skill rather than technology. And the sum total of all the prohibition raids failed to pay for the cost of confiscating and destroying alcohol. The Democrat in the White House raised taxes to take care of the intoxicated people who remained public drunks. And police, jails, and hospitals cost plenty. And so people started paying twice as much income tax, then four times as much, and after a few years they were paying six times the amount of tax as before Prohibition. Everyone did their damnedest to make Prohibition work, except for the people who were drinking alcohol or making money off smuggling and selling it, and many industrial products needed alcohol to manufacture, such as paint and clothing dye and bug spray. So the government licensed some alcohol factories and told them to put poison in it, and that was called adulterated alcohol. One-fifth of all the alcohol made was pure, while four-fifths was deliberately poisoned using phenol or benzol or methyl alcohol or mercuric chloride or sulfuric acid, and then shipped off to the manufacturers that needed alcohol. And within the year, and for every year after that, tens of millions of gallons of unadulterated alcohol would go missing. The Cosmo Hair Tonic Company reported that they'd sold a lot more bottles than were actually sold, and they would advertise on billboards and in magazines so the name was kept in the front of everyone's mind, bolstering the myth that their Cosmo Hair Tonic was very popular and Cosmo would order thousands of gallons of alcohol to make it when they really only needed hundreds. As soon as the private supply dried up, people started sampling the poison alcohol. They died by the hundreds, half of them women and children. The Prohibition supporters called them deliberate suicides. In 1927, 12,000 people died of poisoned alcohol. Ardent Spirits, page 310. Stuff was being sold that was called Jake, and it made the legs hurt within three or four days, and then the fingers would tingle and get numb, and then stop working altogether, and then the feet would stop working and people had to quit their jobs. Getting Jake foot sounded so bizarre that people didn't believe it, and suspected it was just a made-up story from prohibitionists telling big lies, so people continued to drink bootleg alcohol. <coughs> the health departments counted tens of thousands of cases, but among the people selling Jake were sheriff's deputies and district attorneys, so it was difficult to stop. There was no cure for Jake Foot, and it was finally found that tricresyl phosphate was in the bad booze, the poison put into the alcohol to keep people from drinking it. And that was the information that the Germans would use to come up with sarin nerve gas during Hitler's war. People thought the reports about Jakefoot was a conspiracy to keep prohibition alive for those in government making a great deal of money on unadulterated bootleg liquor sales, and many of the Americans who died from poison alcohol were babies who had been given a spoonful as medicine. In a free market, wages fall when people are not spending money, and money becomes more valuable when there is less of it available, and the sober minority were profiting while the majority drank alcohol, and when the consumption and manufacture of alcohol continued to fall during Prohibition, so did wages and prices. The majority wanted something worth buying with their hard-earned money, but with the depressed economy, fewer and fewer commodities were making their way into the marketplace, and Prohibition brought on the Great Depression because people quit wanting to make money to spend on alcohol and on alcohol-related gatherings. Prohibition made farmers quit farming because the lion's share of joy had gone out of life.
and without alcohol people quit their clubs and their granges and they stopped going out shopping or out on the town because there just wasn't much of a point to it anymore. The post office handled one half of the letters they'd carried before Prohibition, and granges and social clubs vanished, and the rich folks continued to drink and play the stock market, but without the rest of the country coming home to a daily brew, all that paper money had become somewhat meaningless. The stock market crashed because it was thirsty, and people blamed foreigners, especially the Germans. With the stock market crash, Prohibition was doomed. And at the next presidential election, happy days were here again, and Prohibition was repealed on the 5th of December in 1933. <clears throat> the president of the U.S. Brewers Association counseled against, quote, untoward celebration, close quote. Nobody heeded him. At the Anheuser-Busch Brewery in St. Louis, beer capital of the nation, it was like a Hollywood premiere. Floodlights pl played upon the beer sheds as the first barrels were, were trundled forth, and 30,000 beer lovers surged toward the company trucks that formed a motorcade 20 blocks long. In Milwaukee, later hosen-clad celebrants sang Ach du lieber Augustine to the accompaniment of brass bands. A New York barber shop tenor was so infuriated by a fellow singer who muffed the words to Down Where the Wurzburger Flows that he seized him by the collar, shook him hard, and bellowed the correct words into his face. The Rhine by the moonlight's a beautiful sight, imbecile. When the wind whispers low through the trees, 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 not vines, idiot. To show their contempt for near beer, a band of waiters poured the stuff down the sewer. Amid the frenzied bustle, a million and a half barrels were consumed within the first 24 hours, resulting in a nationwide shortage the following day. Ardent Spirits, page 353. Back in the closing days of 1919, just before Prohibition became law, the bar at the Yale Club, with uncanny foresight, had laid in a 14-year supply of liquor. On December 5, 1933, when Utah became the 36th state to ratify repeal, the prescient Yaleys had good reason to clink their glasses. They had timed it almost to the bottle. Drug crazy, how we got into this mess, and how we can get out by Mike Gray, New York Random House, 1998, page 72. Unfortunately, people had become accustomed to not drinking in public and the granges and the community taverns had dried up and disappeared. And drinking that had gone on in people's barns had become prodigious, causing an increase in farm accidents resulting from intoxication or hangovers, and with the new tractors and the new farm machines driven by gasoline engines, the accidents were horrific and usually involved children. To make matters worse, the many millions of people out of work were not helped by repeal, and now stopped looking for work altogether so they could stay busy getting more alcohol to drink and now it and now that it was legal to drink again nobody wanted to go back to the farms where work was always available and where grain could be grown to make liquor since drinking was now accepted as a daily routine rather than a seasonal phenomenon Instead, people headed for the cities because they wanted to buy alcohol, the kind that came in a heavy bottle with a fancy label, instead of drinking it out of canning jars at home. Bums rode the rails and passed around bottles while heating up cans of beans, all the while complaining about unemployment as farming machinery rusted, rusted away back home. What had become of all those illegal stills and all that home brew? What was wrong with staying home and brewing their own? With the New Deal, price control and quotas had stifled the farming industry, and leaving the farm had become the thing to do, and the Depression was exacerbate, exacerbated by the migration of farm people heading to the cities looking for a decent drink, and they came in droves. To further the economic shift in America, 
Returning soldiers didn't want to go back to the farm after seeing Paris, and the government started treating them as willfully misbehaving, irresponsible children. First came the CCC, sending hordes of them off to camps in the wilderness away from any alcohol. And those in the Civilian Conservation Corps were rigidly disciplined and controlled. That seemed to work, so it was on to more and more government programs and an increasing presence of agencies enforcing regulations and devising policy guidelines. As the government tried to whip these worthless drunks into some economic shape, they avoided any laws that would help get people back onto self-sufficient farms because that was where the drinking had started in the first place. Returning everyone back onto their farms had been a primary goal of the New Deal, but with the snapback from repeal, the government wanted to promote less drunkenness, not a resurgence of the healthy little farms with their healthy little stills. When alcohol became legal again, the criminals who had perfected their trade by bootlegging now turned to the drug trade to make a profit and it would be a friend of Anslinger who managed to get Claire Booth loose, including her luggage, out of her hotel when Hitler's war broke out, and his name was Julius A. Van He. Anslinger just called him Van, and his American parents had been born in Belgium, and for five years after the Great War, Van had stayed in Belgium to distribute Hoover's food, for which the Soviets paid $12 million in gold, which was nothing to sneeze at. All over the world, Anslinger had as many friends and agents as the bad guys. Tough and relentless during the war, Charlie Dyer was one of the first to let his hair down when the armistice came. Plastered to his chops, Charlie and Lou Wilson, an American bartender, rushed through the streets shouting and singing, leading the Dutchmen by the hundreds in wild, rollicking song. The Dutch didn't understand Charlie. He was sailing through bless em all, substituting a four-letter word for bless. The protectors, Harry J. Anslinger and the Federal Bureau of Narc Narcotics, 1930 to 1962, page 8. The guns may have gone silent, but the economic war was just getting started. And things in America were improving until the M European banks failed, just when Hoover had gotten the economy going again. And Hoover would receive a 30-minute standing ovation at the 1936 Republican Convention for making a speech comparing the New Deal to what Hitler was doing in Germany. Hoover had actually made money for the government with his food administration during the Great War. And then for several years after Hitler's war, Hoover spent his own money making speeches to Republicans. But some historians said that it had done him no good because his speeches all smacked of revenge towards people who had misjudged him. Hoover went to see Hitler to, for himself. Hoover went to visit Hitler to see for himself what Germany was so excited about, and Hoover decided that Hitler was emotionally insane, but much smarter than people realized. By then, Hitler had begun taking medical advice from his drug-pushing doctor, Dr. Morell. Half the problem with the American economy had been getting goods to the market, and truck drivers had been the first to unionize with the Teamsters. And while Germany's Social Democratic Workers' Party had stood up for trade union workers, Hitler intentionally left out the word union from his political party, and even though many union workers had voted for him because the unions were tired of the slow progress the Social Democrats had been making, after securing their vote, Hitler would abolish the unions. Before the Teamsters, railroads could charge big rates because they were a monopoly and had no fair competition, and to make the point that the price of a ticket could be as high as they desired, the railroads designed their coaches for people who could, who could afford to bathe frequently. The price of a railroad ticket <clears throat> had been too costly for ordinary people. 
but after the Great War the rates went down after all the fancy passenger cars had been used as troop transports by the military, not because the soldiers had damaged the fancy coaches, but because ordinary people had gotten used to riding on trains. Twelve new tanks were built by President Hoover despite the military budget being cut back on account of the Depression and after germany was forced out of the war the japanese surrender would be su would be signed on the uss missouri named after the state of missouri that had been pivotal in the union victory that had brought the greenback dollar into existence Fremont had been courts-martialed because of the looming civil war over the fight about whether California was to be slave or free. So Fremont's bear flaggers had actually started the war between the states. And so the government had seized Fremont's house without payment in 1863 and built Fort Mason. And it was commandeered by the guy who had expected Fremont to send him reinforcements. And the war between the states finally ended in June of 1865. Two years earlier in 1863, In God We Trust had been put on U.S. coins, and people complained to Lincoln that General Grant was always drinking whiskey, so Lincoln told them to find out what brand he preferred so he could send a case to all his generals. Buffalo Bill Cody had fought for the Union, and he'd moved his family to Kansas, where they were attacked by their neighbors for not being pro-slavery, and Buffalo Bill quit the army in 1872 and sent his family to St. Louis, and he went out to the Wild West to lead rich people on expeditions to hunt down Sitting Bull. The army would bring rich folks out for buffalo hunts to discuss investing in firearm manufacturing and the army would tell Buffalo Bill to guide them, and one time in ten days they killed two hundred elk and six hundred buffalo, and one of the shooters was Winston Churchill's grandfather. Buffalo Bill went to Wyoming, where he put in a thirty-six-foot-long bar made of cherry wood imported from France into a hotel, and Buffalo Bill created a Wild West show, with shoot 'em up Indian reenactments that ran from 1883 to 1913 until the show went broke in Colorado because people in Denver had seen enough of that sort of thing. Buffalo Bill had taken his Wild West show to every European country except Portugal, and Buffalo Bill became a friend of Edison who liked making Wild West movies, and Edison called Buffalo Bill a drunk and a womanizer and Buffalo Bill called alcohol Tanglefoot, and Teddy Roosevelt took the name Rough Riders from the Buffalo Bill Show. Santa Anna had wanted taxes from the Americans living in Texas, but they refused to pay because Santa Anna's military would not help the Texans protect themselves from Indian raids. And when Santa Anna destroyed the Texans at the Alamo, it just made Texas stronger and Davy Crockett had also died at the Alamo. Mexico had been selling off large pieces of land in California that had once belonged to the Spanish Catholic Church, and the function of the state, Hoover con concluded, was, quote, the prevention of abuse of the right of property, close quote. The Memoirs of Herbert Hoover, The Great Depression, 1929-1941, to New York, Macmillan, 1952, page 330. Henry Ford believed that companies should not borrow money in order to improve a product, but should use capital from direct sales towards improvements in the company. Henry Ford kept millions of dollars in cash laying around, but had to borrow millions more to make the new Model A and people were keeping their tin lizzies instead of buying the newer model, and Henry Ford would fail to meet payments on his loans. Hitler's war saved Ford by creating a demand for trucks and tanks and boats and boots and guns, and Ford also made helmets and ambulances and airplanes, and wages rose and unemployment fell, and by the end of Hitler's war, so many new products were available in America that business continued to boom despite the lack of demand for war materiel, 
and when market demand began to saturate, the Great Cold War would fill the vacuum. By 1960, the rest of the world owed the U.S. $4 billion of outstanding debt from the Great War, $7 billion in unmatured debt with $8 billion in interest, and the total payments had come to a little less than $3 billion, while the amount paid by Russia had mostly come from selling Russian assets in America. Mr. Merrill from Jacksonville, Florida, opened offices in the suburbs after Hitler's war, and his stock prices were based on real material gains rather than on speculation, and Merrill made it possible for housewives to invest, and those women knew the quality of the products and therefore the worth of the stocks they were buying. Mr. Lynch joined with Mr. Merrill to buy the chain of Safeway stores with its motto, Ingredients for Life. And Safeway had been started by Samuel Skaggs, who was born in Tennessee and moved to Missouri, then took his family west in 1907 to American Falls, Idaho, where he opened a dry goods store with his six boys. Skaggs's customers had to pick up a basket by the door and gather their own groceries rather than being waited on individually by fastidious clerks. And Skaggs also refused to extend credit, and he bought goods wholesale to drive down prices for his customers. <clears throat> the wholesale was made possible by the Union Pacific Railroad that stopped in American Falls and his business was also helped by mixing with the industrious Mormons, so that more than 3,500 Safeway stores were opened by 1931. Thanks to Merrill Lynch, the Dow Jones would rise to 300 by 1954, and was finally back to where it had been in 1928 before the Great Crash. And Markowitz at the University of Chicago won the Nobel Prize in the 50s for suggesting that people could spread the risk of stock investing with diversified portfolios, and Markowitz's plan did not make people a lot of money, but would give them basic steady gains. Innovations in housing after Hitler's war, coupled with the GI Bill, made countless new houses available to working-class Americans and Donald Trump's father was successful in building homes for the baby boom as good and decent Americans strove to replace all the souls that had been lost during Hitler's war. The trick to making the economy boom was to get dollars into the hands of consumers so they could spend, and that meant convincing ordinary Americans to take the money they had hidden under their mattresses and had buried in jars in their backyards and put that cash into a bank so it could be loaned out to earn, in, earn interest, and people were encouraged to learn to trust the flow of commerce. To make dollars av available, the U.S. borrowed from the Federal Reserve by selling them a bond and the Treasury printed currency to pay for the bond. In America, the President was bound by law to get approval from Congress before taking military action, and if the President sent U.S. troops without their approval, Congress could cut off the money needed to supply those troops, while in England, if the troops were not being fed, the King could order the Crown Bank to buy supplies, and if the bank refused to make the loan, the King could send some soldiers over to open the vaults in the name of the King and send everyone at the bank to the tower. The English crown had thought that no Republican government could work because there would be no way to prevent the government from charging taxes that were too high. So the U.S. gave sovereignty to the individual states in order to keep the U.S. government from acting like the crown, and individual states were allowed to raise their own taxes and were expected to take care of their own business. The states were not allowed to coin their own money, but were required to use U.S. currency. That had become the Federal Reserve note in the Great War. And hostilities broke out seven months after the emergence of the new Fed currency. During the German Spring Offensive, or Kaiserschlacht, 
in March of 1918. Samuel Walton was born on a farm in Oklahoma, and then Walton's family moved to Missouri, where young Sam became the youngest Eagle Scout in the history of the state of Missouri. Sam Walton went to college and joined ROTC and waited tables, and he was asked to join a fraternity, and he also became president of the Bureau Bible class and was voted, quote, permanent class president, close quote. Sam Walton's grandfather's family had moved west. <clears throat> Sam Walton's grandfather's family had moved west to get away from the aftermath of the war between the states. And when Sam Walton graduated from high school in 1936, his team had never lost a football game, and Sam Walton would graduate from college with a bachelor's degree in economics in 1940. Sam Walton was working at J.C. Penney's when he joined the army for Hitler's war, but he couldn't pass the physical because there was something wrong with his heart. So he was put on a reserve list and went to work for a DuPont gunpowder factory and then was stationed in Utah working for Army Intelligence. After Hitler's war, Sam Walton borrowed $20,000 from his father-in-law and added $5,000 of his own that he'd saved from the Army. And he started buying a Ben Franklin... He started by buying a Ben Franklin five-and-dime store and then he bought more Ben Franklin chain stores, and in a few years he was able to pay back the loan from his father-in-law. Sam Walton changed the world of business by keeping track of product inventory using a computer instead of counting things by hand on the shelves, and he moved to Bentonville, Arkansas, and allowed his customers to take what they wanted from his shelves instead of having a clerk do it for them, just as the customers at Safeway had been doing. Sam Walton bought more stores in Missouri and Kansas, and he bought merchandise in large volumes and stored the overstock so he could sell at low prices, and he made a million dollars in his first year, and then Sam Walton went into the banking business so he could loan himself more money. The first store to be called a Walmart was on West Walnut Street, and by the time the Beatles broke up, there were 32 Walmarts, and Sam Walton was $2 million in debt. Going public on the stock, stock market allowed 100 more Walmarts to open every year, and electronic banking would further the success of Walmarts by bypassing the challenge of getting actual dollars into the hands of shoppers. The Mark I computer, built in 1943, had been able to do three editions per second, and its mechanical switches sounded like a room full of people knitting. And by 1946, ENIAC could do 4,500 editions per second. And by 1972, computers could do a million editions per second. Walmart rode the wave of business triumph along with the growth of computer banking. And in 2008, the money supply would be cut by 40% without touching a single paper dollar. Henry Ford had taken his $12 million out of the bank in D Detroit, and the failure of the banks in Ford's home state had been the beginning of the bank failures that followed, and the radio had helped to spread the panic, and the people Hoover wanted to rout were described as any investor who, quote, regards regulations as challenges to his cleverness rather than as expressions of public policy, close quote, the greatest ever bank robbery by Martin Meyer, New York, Charles Scribner's Sons, 1990, page 169. In the 20s, the brokers selling stock on the street had begun the American Stock Exchange to rival the New York Stock Exchange. And when investors lost their money, they would show up in person and clog up the marketplace so the stock exchange would close. And for four months at the beginning of the Great War, the stock exchange was closed because people were panicking while insiders were making huge profits. <clears throat> Hoover thought that FDR and the Democrats scared people because rather than failing banks, they thought... The Dems would spend all their money and raise their taxes. Hoover thought that FDR and the Democrats scared people 
more than more than the failing banks more than the fa- more than the failing banks Hoover thought <clears throat> that FDR and the Democrats scared people more than the failing banks because they thought the Dems would spend all their money and raise their taxes and they thought that the Dems would lend money to their shady neighbors who had no plan to pay it back. Most of all, people were afraid that the big government that had brought on the Great War would come to grind them up again and so to keep their money away from the government they took their cash out of the banks and put it under their mattresses. Before the Great War, every other household had at least one cook two maids, and a driver who worked as a handyman. And after Hitler's war, the American family emerged as the primary economic unit, and the transition had begun after the Great War, when people simply could no longer take orders from people claiming to be their quote-unquote betters, since the war had been caused by these betters, and people now knew that claiming superiority, that people, that those claiming superiority were clearly insane, or at best, incompetent. The world of business experienced an equal quantum evolution from the days when factory owners thought that union workers were lazy, vicious people out to bankrupt them, while they treated their chauffeurs and other servants with kindness and respect. The Fed cut the money supply by 30% in 1928, and people who had money hidden under their mattresses enjoyed their cash being worth more for a while. And Britain defaulted in 1928 by refusing to pay America, claiming that Germany was refusing to pay in gold. The U.S. had been loaning money to Germany, and Britain would not borrow to pay America. And American banks started calling in loans in order to stay in business now that there were were no repayments coming from the British. The American Red Cross didn't come and serve coffee in Harlan County, although one Red Cross warehouse was broken into by the unemployed so they could help themselves. And Hoover donated $2,500 out of his own pocket while Quakers went into Harlan County and weighed the children to measure their decline. FDR went ahead with Hoover's lending laws that had failed to pass Congress before, and the bank holiday, the FDIC guarantee on deposits, and the Emergency Banking Act were all from Hoover. And President Wilson had said that senators' heads were knots that kept their bodies from unraveling. And Hoover had called Congress, quote, that beer garden up there on the hill, close quote. Hoover, page 257. Most of the money for relief during the Great Depression came from the Rockefellers, while Stalin was busy purging the Red Army of anyone who had ever cooperated in any form or fashion with Britain, and the British were busy making deals with Poland over the coal trade, and Hassel, the German ambassador to Rome, was fired on the 4th of February in 1938 and began to conspire with the British to overthrow Hitler. Hassel had shown disdain for being made subordinate to Wilhelm Keitel on the 4th of February when Hitler reorganized the Army High Command, because Keitel was a mere commoner, unlike the blue-blooded Christian August Ulrich von Hassel, who had been a direct descendant of important Hanoverian nobility. And Hassel also sported a considerable dueling scar. In August of 1939, Hitler made a pact with Stalin that was a deal splitting Poland in half between them and giving the port of Danzig back to Germany, and 1939 had been the summer of peace in Paris. When I came to the Ritz Hotel on the Place Vendôme, I found that the Ritz was very much the same. There was the same smiling little manager at the reception desk, with his long cutaway coat that almost touched his heels behind, the same smoothly efficient and omniscient red-moustached concierge, and the grey distinguished Olivier, the great maitre de hotel of Europe, bowing as always at the end of the corridor in the dining-room door. 
I said to the Vogue editor, but is it my imagination, darling, that makes me think they look a little more solemn and pale than of yore? She answered, yes, darling, I'm afraid it's just that imagination of yours. And from the smells of fur and perfume, and the sounds of high bird babble voices, which when you close your eyes sound like the noises you hear as you're just going under ether, I saw right away that the guests of the Ritz were the same sort of guests that they had always been. Europe in the Spring, page 60 and 61. Hitler moved into Poland the first week of September in 1939, and Britain and France declared war on Germany, and by the end of the month the Gestapo was given extraordinary police power to keep the Jew communists from doing any further damage to Germany. Hitler gave Mussolini permission to go into Greece in October to keep the British there busy while planning Rommel's North African adventure, to keep the British from seizing the Suez Canal, although it could have been a joint venture between them to exclude the Italians and the French from the global market. On the 1st of March in 1940, Sumner Wells arrived in Germany from America and spent three days in Berlin talking to the Nazis to find out if Britain and Germany could get along well enough to continue making payments on their debt to America. The American president of General Motors was in Berlin at the time, wanting to do business with Germany and getting along well with them, and as Sumner Wells arrived in Berlin, the British announced they were cutting off shipments of German coal to Italy through Rotterdam hoping to force the Italians to buy coal from England. And Hitler told Italy that he was unimpressed because he could make all the coal deliveries to Italy by railroad.